So Matt, this is yours. All right. I'll start really by just saying personally, thank you uh, for pulling me into the board of GBTU. Uh, it's been really an honor to sort of watch you operate and learn from you. Uh, I know that I feel like, and I'm sure Mike does too, there's, there's big shoes to fill. Um, and we're very glad that you're going to be remaining on the board to uh, help us navigate the, the future here. But uh, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so sort of turn the focus now to um, trout power. And I guess maybe what I'll do is just sort of preface Chris's uh, talk with a few remarks about sort of why, why I thought, why we thought um, bringing the trout power story would be sort of cool for the GBTU membership to hear about. Um, you know, I think as, as fisher people and conservationists, it's good for us to sort of generally be informed about what's happening in the community and uh, within sort of the organizational ecosystem, if you will. Um, I think there's a lot of synergy in our space between all the different organizations that have missions that are focused on fisheries and cold water resource um, conservation. We're all showing up because we're passionate about fishing. Um, we're passionate about taking care of these resources and we wanna gain a deeper understanding of, uh, of the fisheries and other resources to sort of support us in that effort so that we can um, give back to them and to protect them. Um, and I think that within that space, what Trout Power does is relatively unique um, in terms of the way it operates, the, the data that Trout Power is collecting and analyzing, and really what Trout Power is looking to do. Um, so I think in that way, it's just good to have awareness of other, ki other kinds of work that are happening out there, especially something sort of unique like Trout Power. Um, I also think in a lot of ways that what Trout Power does is highly complementary to the work of Trout Unlimited. Um, you know, it's a big sandbox, and I think the, the types of things that Trout Power is doing doesn't fully overlap with Trout Unlimited, but certainly is informative. Um, and in fact, there's been a few instances in the past of partnership between the groups, and I think there's opportunities for, for more collaboration in the future um, that are on the horizon. And I think sort of on the Trout Power side of things, uh, we're very excited about those opportunities. And just in general, we have all have at least uh, one common trait in general uh, that we share is that within our region, we all reside within um, and fish within the native range of the Northeastern brook trout, um, which in my eyes is a very special fish for a number of reasons. It's one that's very near and dear to my heart as I grew up uh, learning how to catch these fish in the Adirondacks with our speaker who also happens to be uh, my cousin, which is why we have the same last name. Um, but I, I think just sort of it's it's good for for all of us to learn more about these fish. Um, so Trout Power is a group that's really based uh, based in and focused on watersheds in upstate New York. But um, the work that Trout Power is doing is definitely informative to fishery management. Chris has some good examples of that um, in conservation in general. And I think that the template for what Trout Power does and how Trout Power collects data is definitely something that can serve as a model for future research. Um, sort of another tool in the belt, if you will, although it is somewhat specialized in the way that we sort of carry out that work. Um, Trout Power is a, it's a really cool story um, in terms of how it came about, traces its roots back to sort of the resilience of these uh, wild native fish um, that were sort of fighting the onslaught of acid rain in the 80s and the 90s in the Adirondacks um, and watching these fish uh, sort of rebound from that um, it, it came upon a, a group of uh, passionate outdoorsmen and anglers to sort of get together um, and they decided to, to begin to study these fish to learn more about sort of their genetic origins, biodiversity, adaptive traits, um, and it's really blossoming into a, a number of cool different projects that I know Chris is going to go into more detail on. Um, and I know at Trout Power we're, we're really excited about a couple things we've got going on this year and in the future. Um, so a little bit about, about Chris. Uh, Chris stepped in as the president of Trout Power and has been sort of at the helm for a number of years. He took over from the former president, who was also the founder of the organization. Um, Chris is also a high school science teacher. Uh, he lives in Vermont. Uh, he brings that to the table. He also wears a number of other different hats uh, that have him doing work with groups like New York State DEC and other local uh, area conservation and fishing-based organizations. Um, I personally marvel at Chris and sort of the interconnectivity that he's formed in this space. Um, and he has a lot of really good knowledge and insight, I think, to share. Um, in addition to that, he's a lifelong fisherman. And for as long as I've known him, he's almost always outfished me. So there's that. Um, but I'm grateful to him because I've learned a lot from him. He pulled me into Trout Power about a year ago. I've been on the board for about that much time with Trout Power as well as uh, working with GBTU. 
um, and that's been really exciting work. So in, I'm sort of handed over to Chris. I'm really excited for, uh, for GBTU to hear a little bit more about what Trout Power does. And if you're interested to learn more or sort of follow along with the work that Trout Power is doing, I know Chris can sort of uh, explain to you how to be engaged or how to sort of follow along. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Chris, for joining us tonight. I know you've done a couple of these presentations for other TU chapters. I got to, to see one of them and I know it went really well. So excited for you to, uh, to dive right in. So take it away, Chris. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Hey, everyone. Uh, good to see uh, uh, folks. I know I met a few, Rui and a few others I met down at the uh, Fly Show in Marlboro uh, a couple months back. Um, but again, thanks for having me. Like uh, Matt said in a wonderful introduction there, um, uh, my name is Chris Murphy. I am a high school science teacher up in Vermont, way up in Vermont. I'm actually up in the Northeast Kingdom, about uh, two miles south of the Canadian border. So um, we still have uh, about a foot and a half of snow up here and it's still winter outside. It was actually just snowing when I came over here and we're, uh, we're still in winter. And I think you guys are actually seeing the fact that it, according to the calendar is spring. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to, pardon me, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about our nonprofit organization. Um, we are, you know, obviously I know this is for folks down in Boston and Eastern Mass, which means you guys are probably fishing a lot of salt and uh, maybe going inland and fishing some, some trout and some bass inland. Um, we're going to talk specifically about one of our native chars, which is brook trout. I'm going to talk about what the organization does, uh, specifically how we do it, um, and then some of the, the, not only the results that we've had, but kind of the, uh, I guess, the who cares aspect, right? Or like why we're taking the, the time and the energy and the effort uh, to do this, and, and um, other than the fact that it's fun, which certainly is a part to that. So, uh, as mentioned, I am a science teacher, so forgive me because I'm going to go science teacher on you about twice, uh, including now. So that's your fair warning. Uh, no worries if you decide to leave. I don't allow my students to do that, but I guess I can't keep you on the meeting there. So, uh, so I'll beg your pardon here. I'm going to go science teacher for about two minutes. Uh, here's why. So here's our, our geology, our geologic history lesson. Um, really, you know, trout power goes back to actual establishment as a nonprofit 501c3 was in uh, 2017. But if we look at what we're actually doing, um, and a lot of what I'm sure you guys do at TU, you know, it really starts thousands and thousands of years ago. So um, for our region in the Northeast United States, if we think about what was here about 12,000 years ago, this area, and, and I think Boston, I think that area, let's maybe we'll drift a little bit north and say with certainty, um, our, ever, our area was covered by a giant glacier, a giant, giant ice sheet called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Um, so that's kind of our starting point, if you will. Um, over time, if we kind of fast forward over, you know, from 12,000 years to 11, 10,000 years, uh, what happens is, is that glacial, you know, sheet starts to recede, it starts to move northward. Um, so here's, here's why that's important. Here's why I always kind of start with that, is that when we look at what happens, um, and I think this is really cool. So if you take anything from the presentation, a little history, especially if you ever come up to our lovely Green Mountains or go over to the Adirondacks, um, what happened is as that glacier receded, what occurred was actually ocean water from the St. Lawrence Seaway spilled down south into uh, the area that we know now as Lake Champlain over towards Montreal and even towards the, the Great Lakes. Um, and that area was called the Champlain Sea. So that was actually a salt you know, a marine environment. Um, actually in Vermont, our state fossil is a beluga whale. And that's further evidence of this process happening. And our landlocked salmon that we still have in Champlain are kind of our one living thing that we have as, as evidential proof of this Champlain Sea. Um, over time, uh, what happens is that a, the Champlain Sea, along with all of these other really large lakes that we find within Massachusetts and Vermont and New Hampshire, so large today, more large in quantity, not so much as quality. Well, back in the day, they were all, at least evidence shows, all interconnected. So you have these huge, huge lake systems. Um, so thinking about the amount of fish movement, fish passage we could have between these various water bodies and their tributaries. Um, however, what happens over time is that there's a, a process called post-glacial rebound. Basically, ice is heavy. 
So when you have a crap ton of it, that's a scientific measurement, by the way, when you have a crap ton of it pressing down on the land, it compresses the ground, it lowers the elevation of the land. And um, once that sheet recedes and is off, the ground comes back up, it rebounds. So as that rebound occurs, some of our huge long chain lakes that we have, um, those get divided up into smaller lakes and ponds. Uh, the Champlain Sea that was connected to the St. Lawrence Seaway, that gets disconnected. Um, and that turns into what we call Lake Vermont, and then eventually has continued to rebound and really actually shrink in surface water size. Um, and it's become what we now call Lake Champlain. And we're left with this beautiful spattering of lakes and ponds and connected and disconnected water bodies throughout Vermont, New Hampshire, Mass, and New York State. Um, on this map, you can see uh, within the green shadowed region um, is the Adirondack Park. Uh, the reason I picked this map is that most of Trout Power's work that we are currently doing, uh, part, pardon me, all of our work actually, is within the Adirondack Park. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why, uh, but that's kind of the, the very quick snapshot geologically, um, very surface level between 12,000 years ago and, and today. Um, now, thinking about 12,000 years ago versus today, one cool piece of evidence that we have is we still have our cold water species that have been in our area for thousands of years. Things like our native char, lake, lake trout um, and brook trout, our whitefish, our Atlantic salmon, some of which landlock, obviously some that are still in the oceans and in some places, mainly up in Canada, coming back up into our rivers as Andromeda salmon. Um, for us, our focus is on the brook trout. State fish of Vermont, state fish of New York, uh, my personal favorite fish. And uh, as I kind of joke with our, our members, we're damn lucky that it's a really, really pretty fish and you catch them in pretty places because it makes our logo and what we do a lot more attractive when you're pulling in beauties like this. That's actually, uh, being transparent, that's actually a Vermont brook trout, but uh, nonetheless, beautiful fall colors on. So, um, so looking at uh, New York State kind of shifting over, specifically looking at New York. Um, within New York, as a result, result of all of that glacial action, as well as the rebound, you know, we have over 7,600 lakes and ponds, um, over 70,000 miles of streams and rivers. And a lot of these places had fish. However, there were some that maybe they had some fish and we caught a lot of them and kept them. Maybe there were areas that didn't see a lot of fish. Uh, regardless of the original purpose, um, New York State started to stock fish within those waterways uh, in the year 1879 and 1880. Those are the first records we have of state-led stocking as well as private stocking that was happening, occurring. So uh, when we think about stocked versus wild fish, uh, I know there's the, the kind of the adage of a fish is a fish and they're fun to catch and I completely agree. And I've spent many days smiling catching stocked fish. Um, I think I smile a little bit more when I catch wild fish. They're usually a little bit uh, more vibrant, both in color and in spirit and in fight. Um, but when we think about this from a scientific perspective, when we look at this in terms of the genetics, which we really focus on in trout power, and I'll, I'll talk about how we do that, you know, we're really focusing on wild fish. Now, what we're doing is that the fish that we're catching, um, that we do a lot of background research on to hypothesize they're wild, um, we're comparing our wild fish to the genetics of stock fish to gain more information about those species. And what we're really trying to do as a whole is throughout the Adirondack Park. Um, if you've been to the Adirondacks, if you frequented the Adirondacks, um, it reminds me a lot of some of the areas of the White Mountains in New Hampshire, um, areas of Maine, areas in the Green Mountains. There's a lot of remote wild country with a lot of water um, that really isn't frequented. Yeah, you'll see people, you know, fishing or hiking along these water bodies, but they're not getting the constant pressure that some of our larger river systems are, are getting. Um, so when we look at these wild fish, we're really trying to figure out about, you know, their genetics, but then also if the hypothesis is that they've been here for thousands, maybe 10,000 years, we'll go with thousands, um, you know, they've, they've gone through a tremendous amount of change. Again, 12,000 years ago, where I am right now would be covered in a mile of ice. I got about a foot of snow outside, right? So things, things have changed in 10,000 years. Our globe has always changed. It will always continue to change. Um, so we need to see what these fish are doing um, and anything that we can gain in terms of information of what they're doing and how they're adapting and changing 
uh, will only help us to preserve this gem of the species. So, um, so the kind of the fun hy hypothesis question here is, is that of those fish, when that glacier receded 10,000 years ago, and as we had Lake Vermont and all of these massive lakes stretching from Massachusetts up to the Canadian border, you know, are there any of those original populations? Are there still descendants of those original fish that are swimming in our waterways today? Um, and that's one of the things that we kind of try to, to go and check out. So uh, with all that background aside, what I'm gonna just kind of discuss is, you know, what specifically we do in terms of what of our projects we do, um, how do we do those projects? And then what are some examples of the results that we've recovered and seen? Um, and what do we actually do with that? What do we, we use that data for? So um, Trout Power itself, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Again, we established as a nonprofit in 2017. Um, the actual grouping of the group came together a couple of years before that, but uh, 2017, and I'll mention why, was where we really kind of took off and said, hey, we, we think we have something unique here. So um, let's, let's make it a little bit more official. Let's make it a little bit more serious. So um, what, our, uh, what our mission statement is, is that we are uh, enlisting the power of anglers to protect, restore, and enhance um, heritage and genetically unique brook trout populations and their habitats across their native range, mainly through citizen science, advocacy, um, as well as stewardship. Now, whoa, trigger finger, sorry. Um, so basically what we do if we kind of lump some of this together is that we are, first off, we are a completely volunteer-based organization. We have no paid members. Um, we have no paid board members, president. Um, if anything, it probably cost me a lot of money to be president of this group, but that's that's okay. I'm a rich, I'm a rich guy because I'm a science teacher. So, um, <laughs> but uh, we are all volunteers. We have a number of our own solo projects that we do. Uh, we work with a number of other groups and organizations ranging from various Trout Unlimited chapters to state level groups like the DEC. Uh, and we also work with a variety of universities on a variety of different projects. So um, one of my favorite parts about working with this group, uh, not just from the fisherman side of things, but also uh, from the high school science teacher perspective, is that we are, as a group, a really stunning example of citizen science. So if that's a, a term maybe that you've heard before, but you're not overly familiar with citizen science, which I'm sure a lot of you have participated in, but maybe haven't known it consciously while you were doing it. Um, citizen science is a form of science where part or all of the research is conducted by amateur scientists. Um, so for our group, we have people who go out into the field and sample for trout, aka we catch them with fly rod and reel and barbless flies. Um, and then we turn over our samples to a variety of universities, depending on what we're looking at, they do the actual genetic work, give it back to us, and then we take a look at the results and see what we found. Um, so an image over here to the left, this is at a great camp in the Adirondacks. That was an event we had a couple years, uh, four years ago now, um, and a variety of our volunteers uh, after a weekend of successful fishing and sampling, um, but I could also say after a weekend of citizen science practice. Um, so with citizen science, there's a number of advantages to it. And I know the Trout Unlimited, I, I saw some of the things that you guys reported on at the beginning of the meeting. Um, you know, Trout Unlimited, groups like Trout Power, we're, you know, it showing these different advantages. You know, one thing that's great is that it's economical. We have passionate volunteers that get excited to come to these events. Uh, when we get events with a large amount of volunteers, we can cover a lot of ground. Um, when we're mapping out events and areas that we're going to go sample, um, you know, we don't pick one stream. We pick a, a swath of streams. We try to get out there and really cover a wide expanse. Um, it's a great way to educate and connect to the public and do outreach like this and plenty of other events that we've done. Um, and then fortunately for us and for our volunteers, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's fishing with a little bit of science worked in. So um, citizen science is a great thing. I applaud the efforts that I've heard about you guys doing down in GBTU and throughout the Eastern Massachusetts area. And um, it's, a, it's a great thing that we're, we're a part of in different ways. So um, the ways that we do it, what we do in terms of trout power. So we kind of have three things that we're really involved in terms of field studies. Uh, well, I'll talk, I'll talk about each one of these in detail. Um, first off, we've been a part of a number of what we call presence, non-presence studies. Those are primarily in conjunction with the DEC, so our State Department of Environmental Conservation in New York. Um, 
We also do genetic analysis, searching for unique strains, trying to map the biodiversity of brook trout that we have within the Adirondack Park. Um, and then we also have a couple uh, long-term monitoring studies, one that's been ongoing for a few years and one that we're actually gonna get going in a couple months. Um, so we'll talk about why we're doing those long-term studies once we've identified the population of fish that's there. Um, so first off, uh, presence, non-presence studies, what we've done, and we've done this in a few separate areas, and I'll talk about an example we did five years ago, um, is that we've been contacted a couple times by the New York State DEC asking us to go into a certain area, uh, whether it's a wilderness area, a new tract of land that they've just acquired, or just an area that they don't have any data from. Um, and what we do is we go in and we fish the designated streams that they ask us to fish to see if there are fish, wild fish or not. Uh, we log whatever species we catch and where we catch them. Uh, we're also trying to map any barriers. So for different species, we have definitions given to us by the DEC um, that says what would be considered an impassable barrier. So for example, for brook trout, anything that has from the surface of the water to the bottom, you know, like a waterfall, for example, anything that has at least 18 inches plus of clearance is considered an impassable barrier. Um, that's not a stream grading of 18 inches. That's, you know, just boom, a clear drop. So we mark those as well to think about fish connectivity and fish passage, um, logging any landmarks that we see. And then the biggest thing is that if we don't find any fish, then that allows the DC to go in, take their teams in, um, and electroshock to see, you know, are there truly no fish there? So we, I think in this way, are really helping the DC, like so many of our state organizations that we have, they are underfunded, they are understaffed, and they are overworked in the demand of what they have to do. Um, so in this way, if we can lighten the load, but also give them usable data that they can rely on, um, that's really important to us. And hopefully, and we've been told many times by them that we're helping the state in those, uh, those missions. Um, so here's just an example. Like I said, this is one we did five years ago. Uh, there's a wonderful area that's down in the southern, area, uh, southern part of the Adirondacks called the Silver Lake Wilderness. Um, this wilderness area has one road that comes in from the east. It goes about halfway in, and then it just comes to a dead stop, and there's a few campsites. Besides that, there's nothing but hiking trails. There's no roads um, and a wide variety of streams. Uh, so what we did is that we went in and hiked all over the place. We were doing some long... This. Uh, this is a picture that's uh, Keith Tidball, who's a member of our group and uh, works at Cornell University. Um, there's one of those impassable barriers, definitely more than 18 inches on that waterfall. Um, that was for me and Keith to get back there. That was a 15 mile day. So we go back far. We cover a lot of ground. Um, but within two weekends, uh, one in spring of 2018, one in spring of 2019, all of the streams that you can see in this image over to the right side, my right side, um, anything marked with a number, we went and sampled and either found presence of or no presence of brook trout. But I would say 85 to 90% of those streams had brook trout in them. So we were simply going in, seeing if there are fish, marking where we catch them. Um, but then also, as we did these missions, we were able to also do our genetic work as well. So, and then here's that aforementioned kind of one road that comes in, and then you can see how all of this here is just state public land and um, some beautiful, beautiful uh, country in there. A lot of moose sign and bear sign too, which was kind of an unexpected yet fun surprise. Um, so that's an example of one thing that we do, which is just going into areas and seeing, are there fish in these designated water bodies or not? Now, while we're doing that, if we're doing it for the state or if we're just doing it on our own accord, what we really focus on and what we kind of say our bread and butter is, is actually doing genetic analysis on various populations of brook trout. Um, we are looking for and really get a hoot when we identify strains that we call genetically unique strains. So when we compare populations of any species, yes, all of these fish are certainly one species of brook trout. However, when we look at them in terms of actual genetics and genetic signatures, they have their own, un own unique genetic strains and various populations throughout an area. Um, I am not going to pretend to know a lot about salt. I fished off Martha's Vineyard a little bit when I was a kid. Um, loves catching stripers and blues. Uh, I don't know much about them. Don't know anything about the genetics of them. I'm a trout and char guy, but um, I would imagine that within those species, there has to be some genetic uniqueness and some variation. 
Um, so it's really neat to see that. And then also, if you look with me at the slide, you look at these two images, these are two fish from populations that we found and identified as genetically unique. Now, if you look at them, both beautiful, striking fish, um, but visibly very different, right? These are from two different streams. Um, this fish over here to the left, you can see it almost has like a, a blue violet cobalt color to it. Um, a very dark, dark back, some almost black at the top versus this fish over on the right, more of kind of that, you know, brown olive color, much more vibrance in the yellow. So the biggest thing that we see in terms of the genetic expression is that a lot of the fish that we catch in different populations have an actual different visual appearance. Um, all beautiful, but that's just something always when I look back at pictures of what we've done, um, always just so striking to me and uh, really, really amazing to see how the genetics are expressed. So when we talk about these genetic unique fish um, in New York, uh, in the 80s, um, a fishery manager was working on the inland trout stream management plan, and they used the term heritage strain, uh, which I always put in quotes because it really is a human created term that was used to describe genetically unique fish within New York State. And what they found was they found a total of um, eight, and then some people argued nine heritage strains within the Adirondack Park. Um, this sign over to the left side is uh, from the Wild Center, which is up in Tupper Lake. It's an eco center, um, education outreach based place. And they have this tank, they have two, they have little Tupper strain and windfall strain brook trout on display. Um, and they have this wonderful exhibit where they say, you know, the Adirondack Gate. Um, we believe, and we've contacted them, and we have a, a wonderful dialogue with them. And I don't mean that sarcastically. We, we've had some great conversations about how, you know, we have very, very strong scientific evidence that there's more than eight of these strains. And through our work, we believe that there's a lot more than eight strains out there, which is really exciting to, to see that that genetic uniqueness and biodiversity that originated 10,000 plus years ago, you know, is still there within the Adirondack Park. So here's how we do this. Here's how we can actually go from saying, hey, you know, we study brook trout to actually what we do. Um, so this is a, our fin clip protocol. So this is a card that anytime a volunteer comes to one of our missions, um, I, first off, I, we have missions every single year. I invite anyone and everyone to come and join us. They're usually a, a hoot and a half, a lot of fun. Um, how we actually do this is that we go into the field and once we catch a fish at a designated stream, um, we take a very small tissue sample from the top part of the tail. So the way that we do that is that, as I'll show in a moment, each volunteer gets a fin clip kit. Uh, they get a pair of scissors, they get a lighter, and they get vials that are filled with 90% ethanol. Um, and then they also get a data card that they fill out with the required information. So we catch fish, uh, we keep it wet the entire time. Sometimes people just keep them in their nets. Uh, what we actually do is we, um, we put them in gallon Ziploc bags. So you scoop a bunch of water and you put the fish in. Um, I actually have started to do it even when I'm not clipping fish. It's just a great way to keep the fish in the water, keeping them wet, get a chance to kind of hold up the bag and take a look at them. I listen, and I know you guys are catching big fish down there. So you're going to need some like probably a 30 gallon trash bag for a striper. So that, that might be overkill, but for small fish, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, so once we have the fish in the bag, we sterilize the scissors, so we burn them using a butane lighter um, for at least five seconds on each tip. We really carefully, we really stress to our volunteers, we are trying to protect these fish so the most minimal amount of careful handling is possible, keeping your hands wet, keeping the fish wet, uh, and most of the time you can keep the fish in the water and just quickly kind of pull the tail out, snip, little uh, tail clip, uh, we put that in a vial, we immediately release the fish, and then we log every fish exactly where we catch it. Um, we've mapped a lot of biodiversity in the Adirondacks, but we've also mapped the variety within specific watersheds. And we've seen as we've moved up into the headwaters or down within a watershed, we've seen the genetic uniqueness change. Uh, we've seen the signature shift. And uh, so we make sure to really mark every single thin clip specifically where we catch those fish. Uh, once the fish is caught, burn the scissors again. So we're doing at least two rounds of sterilization between each fish. And, uh, and then we're rigging back up and off to the next place. So in terms of actual practice, what this really looks like is uh, something a little bit more like this. So there's your obligatory Ziploc bag shot. 
Uh, it's really helpful. You can clip the fish on your own. Helpful if you have a couple friendly hands close by. Um, clipping the fish, putting it in a vial, uh, logging it. If Quick shout out, and we are certainly not sponsored by them. I wish we were, that'd be sweet. Um, Onyx, if you've ever seen that app, if you do any backcountry exploring or just traveling off the grid, what a great app, uh, specifically for hunters. I am not a hunter myself, but um, if you spend time in the backcountry off the grid and outside of cell phone service, pretty much the entire place I live in here in Vermont has no cell service. So um, I rely on it. It's a great app. Um, and then once we log on our GPS or on our cell phone app, uh, we let the fish go and continue onward. So that's how we're actually collecting these fin clips that we eventually send to our geneticist who does that work. So if you ever come and volunteer with us, which again, everyone here is invited to, and we'd love to see at one of our events, um, there's an example of a fin clip kit. So lighter, pair of scissors, bunch of vials to fill up with brook trout samples. Um, here's an example of a log sheet. So recording the vial number, um, the species, we only sample brook trout. Uh, we did actually one year just for fun. We caught a real, we got a lake trout. And so we took a really small tissue sample. We sent that to our geneticist and he was like, yeah, guys, there's one fish that for the life of me, I just couldn't get anything on. It's like, okay, well, we, we got you. That was a Laker. Um, but besides that, we're only doing brookies. And then again, we log the, the GPS coordinates. So we know exactly where um, all fish are, are actually, uh, are actually caught. So um, if you join us, you'll get these materials and then we give people instructions specifically where we want them to go. So we'll designate, you know, depending on physical ability and uh, how game you are, whether you want to walk two miles, or you want to walk 12, we'll find a spot for you and then send you out into the woods and uh, promise, you, promise you a good time, even when it's rainy and cold, which happens in October. Um, so that's our actual kind of how we do it within the field. Now that's our, our citizen science piece to it, right? Going out into the field, doing our background research, catching these fish, taking that fin clip sample. Um, for the past three years, we've been sending our samples to Michigan State University. Uh, they are the place that does the extraction of the DNA. And then they send it off to a sequencing facility where the DNA gets sequenced. Um, and then those are results are sent to Dr. Spencer Bruce at University of Albany. Spencer is a, uh, a wonderful man. Um, he's a friend of ours. He's been doing work for us since 2016. Um, and I think in a lot of ways is kind of one of the backbones of this organization. Um, he does all our analysis. And then once he's done with the analysis, he sends it back to us. Um, so what we've used for the first four years of sampling is that we use the process called micro satellite analysis. Um, if you think back to the start here, I told you I was gonna go science teacher on you twice and I did once and I, I don't break a promise. So here's number two. I'm gonna tell you really quickly, surface level on, uh, on how we do this. Um, so here's a really generic example. So we have two populations of fish that trout power has gone and collected, population one and two. Note how they even look different. Thank you, filter overlays. Um, our genetic, when we look at uh, DNA, you have four nitrogenous bases, A, T, C, and G. We limit it. We're just going to do C and G for this example. What we do is that once we get that DNA extracted and sequenced, we can get it back. And then through the analysis that Spencer Bruce does, he can compare those genetics to the genetics of the hatchery fish. Now, within the Adirondack Park, New York State stocks six different strains of brook trout. They stock the domestic strain, the tomistomy strain, the domestic Tomiskamy hybrid. And then the other three strains are actually strains of heritage strain or genetically unique brook trout that are found within the Adirondack Park, uh, which are the windfall strain, the little tupper strain and the Horn Lake strain. So we have the genetics of those six strains. We can compare the wild fish that we catch to those six strains. And then that helps us to discover, okay, you know, are these fish, do we see some overlap? Do we see complete overlap showing that we've just found stocked fish? Or do we see a situation where we actually have no overlap? So if we look at, for example, population one, population one, we don't see any of the signatures that we see within our hatchery fish. So population one would show us, hey, this is a wild genetically unique fish. And then we can compare it to other genetically unique fish that we've discovered and identified. Um, another thing that we've seen 
and seen frequently, and sometimes we see both examples within a watershed in different places, is that we can see fish that are actually hybrids. So fish that show mostly unique wild DNA, but then have a little bit of hatchery fish found within them. Um, and we'll talk about why, in a way, those fish have actually been almost more influential versus the fish that we found that are just totally wild. Um, now, the nice thing is, is that once Spencer does all of this work and looks at thousands of nitrogen bases in sequence, he gives us these really nice bar plots and bar graphs that we can use uh, to compare to our stock strain. So when you see this data, every single one of these vertical bars represents an individual fish that we have. So here's an example of some data sets that we have. Up on the top half, you can see those are your six strains that are stocked within the Adirondack Park in New York State. So again, the domestic, the domiscomy, the hybrids, windfalls, tuppers, and horns. Um, down below, you see a couple different data sets from trout power. So you just, you have to do um, a little bit of color comparison. And this is where I always um, truly apologize. If, if you are colorblind in any respect, I do apologize um, because that, that would strain the ability to read maybe a couple of these. So, so again, my advanced apologies for that. Um, but what we're gonna do is that I'll show you um, some of our data throughout the years um, and what we found and kind of just reinforcing the biodiversity of the Adirondack Park. So. Um, before we do that, though, right about that, um, in 2020, one thing that I've learned through my time here is that genetic and the world of genetic science is an ever-evolving science, um, and it, it moves, and it moves pretty damn fast. So Microsat in 2016 and TWADS 2017, pretty state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line stuff, really great sequencing ability, tons of data comes back. Um, by the time we got to 2019, Spencer said to us, hey, guys, this stuff is it's getting outdated pretty quickly. So we should probably switch. Um, so fall of 2019, we get super jazzed. We're like, okay, we're gonna switch to this idea of rad sequencing, which is an even higher level and newer um, form of genetic sequencing and sampling. And uh, we said, okay, let's, let's do it. And uh, so we're gonna go through now and kind of look at the results that we've had over the years um, from our trial power missions. And I won't go into too much detail, but uh, so here's 2016. 2016, we go to a watershed in the central Adirondacks, um, kind of on a, a hope and a prayer, if you will, that like, hey, let's see if this genetic stuff works. Let's try it. You never know what's going to happen. We thought maybe if we go way, way up, we'll find a couple of fish that might be wild, you know, or unique. And um, so again, doing kind of a color comparison between our stock strains on the left and the samples collected on the right, you know, that blue coloration shows unique genetic signature that doesn't match anything that's stocked. So it's kind of that holy bleep moment, you know, look at that. We, we found fish that we found a unique population. Holy cow. So this is, this is an area in the Adirondacks that's pretty, pretty remote. We got to drive way down this long dirt road and then hike even further back. Um, so we thought, okay, well, let's, let's move down the watershed. Let's move into areas that are closer to a lake that is, we know for a fact, stocked every spring with brook trout. So again, here's our sample set over on the right side for 2016. 2017, we moved down the watershed. We moved more into direct tributaries of that lake that stocked with brook trout. And clearly, you can still see that blue signature. And even these couple fish here, these were fish caught directly in a tributary right by the inlet to the lake. Um, so we still see that blue unique signature, but then we see all of this mixing. We see all of these different genetic signatures from stocked fish. So that was interesting to us. So now we're seeing, okay, we're seeing wild fish and their DNA, but we're also seeing stocked fish and their DNA. So we can, we can show that we have some hybridization going. We have some stocked fish and wild fish that are, that are breeding together. Um, and I'll, I'll get to in a moment, you know, how that data has been used within New York State. So going through this a little bit quicker now, 2018, 2019, this is that Silver Lake Wilderness area that I talked about doing a presence on presence study. And wouldn't you think it, boom, there's this lovely sky blue color. Yes, we have a little bit of hybridization depending on the stream that we went to, but yet again, we have a unique signature. 
Um, 2018, we go up, there's a large river system starting in the Northwest Adirondacks called the Azoscachi. Went up to the headwaters of that, doing our color com comparison from left to right. Here we have this lovely pink color. Boom, more uniqueness. Uh, 2019, this is actually uh, a project that was a collaboration between Trout Power and the Tug Hill Trout Unlimited chapter. So all of the volunteers for this, using our Trout Power protocol and sequencing, all of the volunteers were Trout Unlimited members. Um, and goodness gracious, these fish are, I mean, just solid violet purple coloration. Um, and some of the most genetically pure fish that we've identified in our organization. And uh, one other side note that I love about this data is that two of these streams that are just all purple are literally right next to roads. So yes, we have days where we do 10 or 15 miles to get back to these streams, but these, these streams literally, they had public access, they were right by roads. And we have completely unique populations of brook trout right there, um, which to me as a science teacher and environmental person, um, that's just, that's awesome. It's, it's really, really uplifting and, and gives me some, some optimism. So, um, so we're cruising every single year since our inception, we found and identified unique fish. 2019, we say, hey, we're gonna switch. We're gonna get this new genetic sequencing. Um, let's go. And then uh, if you think back March, 2020, I think we all, this kind of goes without saying now what happened. Um, so COVID was unfortunately, other than just preventing us from having large events in 2020. Um, and we had some really small ones in 2021 being very careful. Uh, it really crushed us in terms of our genetic work because we just were not able to get our samples analyzed. Um, now, I also recognize that, you know, a pandemic and human medicine probably takes priority over brook trout genetics. I get that. Um, however, uh, finally, we are at the point now where all of our backlog of samples that we've collected um, is being run. We're currently awaiting our results and we should be getting them very soon. Um, so finally, we're really, you know, again, like so many of us in our jobs or in our life or our lifestyle, we're hamstrung by COVID. Uh, we're really finally getting back to the point where we're going to be back at full operating power. We are back at full operating power. Um, we're just waiting for results back from the last three years. So um, we're, we're excited and trying to be patient. So, uh, so the last piece to this is kind of like, all right, so we've, we've gone out, we've identified these fish. We've gone to places, we've helped the state figure out if they're a brook trout or not. So here comes kind of the, the, what have we done with this data? Why is this, you know, why is do we think this is important? Um, so when we talk about our trout species, our char species, our whitefish, all examples of cold water species. So they need clean, cold water to survive. Um, remarkably pollution intolerant. So if water gets too polluted, if it gets too thermally polluted or too warm, um, the fish struggle. They struggle, they get into that zone of thermal stress um, or pollution intolerance and they're not able to survive. So very frequently, you've probably seen, especially if you're a trout fisherman, um, you've probably seen things like this where they say, hey, you know, once you get water temperatures above the mid 60s, unless you're fishing primarily brown trout, and even then, if you're, if you're fishing brookies, once you get into the high 60s, that's where you go and find something else to do. Maybe you go to the ocean, right? Or maybe you go fish for bass, whether the stripers are largemouth or smallmouth. Um, you go for those warm water species. So knowing this, knowing that our trout that we're looking at and that we're studying are cold water fish, knowing that our globe again has changed and will always continue to change. Now we have the technology and the science to figure out, okay, what's happening with our water in terms of temperature and chemistry. Um, but now we have the ability to figure out what's actually happening with the fish at a genetic level. So that's where our long-term studies come in. So we have a watershed where in 2017, 2018, we identified a genetically unique population of brook trout. So what we decided is that because of the history of this strain, this is a strain that was greatly affected by acidic deposition and acid rain throughout the 80s and 90s. Um, I was not frequenting the area at the time because I was a child. However, um, some of the people in our organization who are older and did fish them, you know, tell stories about you know, never ever seeing or catching fish, um, flipping over rocks, looking for bugs and maybe finding one small caddis fly, you know, no stoneflies, no mayflies, very little insect life at all. Um, and now that watershed is thriving. 
Um, we've seen just within the past four or five years, we've seen the brook trout population grow. We've seen the size of the fish grow on average. So we figured, okay, we, we know things are changing and happening here. So let's, let's keep an eye on this. Let's see what's actually going on. So every year what we're doing is that we've, we're continuing to get genetic samples. Um, we've kind of divvied this watershed up into sections. So from each section, we're getting at least 20 samples so we can actually have um, statistical significance. We're taking water chemistry samples. We're taking that during the runoff period in the spring, as well as our base flow chemistry in the summer. Uh, and then throughout the watershed, we have temperature loggers in the water. Um, and then we also have one that's monitoring air temperature as well. So what the goal of this study is, is that over the next 10 plus years, we want to see what's happening to the water, again, temperature wise, chemistry wise, and then how are the fish actually adapting to this? When we look at species that reproduce frequently and that reproduce yearly, you can see adaptation that happens from generation to generation. Now, it may not be a tremendous amount from one year to the next, but when you look at that adaptation over 10, 15 years, you know, our hypothesis, and I guess our hope, is that we're able to see what that change actually is. Um, there's a big project going on right now at Michigan State where they're looking at just that. How do brook trout thermally adapt as the watershed around them gets warmer? So the way that we're doing this is that we use onset hobo loggers. So up here in the top, um, you can see they're very small. That's one in the palm of my hand. Uh, we take these loggers, we build our own casings made out of PVC pipe. Um, and then we get a really large rebarred rod. Um, we stake these into various parts of the stream. Obviously we have permits to do all of this. Um, and then we do that in the spring. And then in the fall, we go back and collect that. So we're hoping to see the stream warm up get the temperatures throughout the summer season and then through the fall cool down and then recover them before the deep freeze that happens in the winter. Um, so again, what we're looking to do is really just see, okay, you know, what's happening and how are the fish adapting to it? They've been here for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So they've clearly had to adapt. Um, so what are they doing? And that's really one of the big aims that we have. Now, one other reason um, that we took this population, and I guess this is a 10 second science lesson here, is that, and I find this really cool, uh, this is a, a diagram produced from some of our science that shows the allelic frequency or the versions of a gene that we find within fish, um, specifically within brook trout within New York State. Um, if you think of alleles or like versions of a gene, right, if we think about eye color, eye color, right? What are different color eyes that we see? We see brown eyes, we see blue eyes, we see green eyes, we see the, the blue green, we see the hazel colorations. Um, alleles are just looking at, when we look at a gene for a trait, how many versions do they have? How many tools in the toolbox do they have? And the pattern is that when you look at a species, the species that has the most versions of a gene are usually the species that adapt and survive change or disturbance much better. So part of the reason that we picked this fish was yes, it's history with recovering from acid rain and rebounding, but also that when we compared it to data sets and all the other fish we had, it had by far the most versions of the gene. So we're also hoping that that will really lead us to seeing some of that adaptation um, because it has a higher potential to happen when you have more alleles within the genome. All right. No more science, I promise. Now we're going to kind of talk about the, the last piece here. Um, so in terms of, you know, what we've used the data to do, because again, these long-term studies, we're going to start one in the central Adirondacks this year um, on a research preserve. Uh, we have one that's happening on public land. It has happened for years. So what have we actually done in terms of using our data to help brook trout? Um, I think for me, I think the biggest thing that we have been a part of directly and indirectly is that Within um, 2018 and then 19, um, the New York State DEC took a look at their pretty outdated, and they, by their own admission, would say outdated inland trout stream management plan. Um, throughout 2018, 2019, and into 2020, COVID again kind of hit the pause button here for a bit. Um, there were public meetings and public outcries. And what the overall kind of verdict was is that people that were looking for more wild fish, healthier populations of wild fish. Yes, areas where it was kind of put and take fisheries, but 
you know, more, more wild fish, more people fishing with fly rods than when they did these meetings back in the 80s. Um, so there were a few people at the DC, one in particular, um, who was very adamant that stocking over wild fish would not have any detrimental effect in terms of the genetics or hybridizing between stocked and wild fish. Um, very, very adamant, outwardly adamant about that fact. And as we saw earlier, some of our data um, clearly counters that pretty strongly and repeatedly we saw fish that had hybridized between stocked fish and wild fish. Um, and the DC really took note of that. Um, they were really, really interested in that. And I think that in the DC's eyes and amongst New York State and different groups, I think that was what, in a way, I don't want to say put us on the map, depends on whose map you're looking at. Um, but I think we got some recognition for that. And I actually know that person was so um, overwhelmingly embarrassed uh, that I, I believe that person actually eventually stepped down because um, they, <laughs> they, were, they were proven wrong and really uh, were not very thrilled about that. And again, kind of left with a tail between the legs there, if you will, which I don't take pride in saying that, but um, he didn't check his facts before he went out there and barked all over. Um, so long story made short, what happened was, is that we are part of conversations with the DC. Um, in this picture here is, this is our, our founder, uh, Jordan Ross. Um, JP is a adamant fly fisherman, also a wonderful fly rod builder, builds really great rods, specifically for small streams, um, just builds absolutely gorgeous rods. And uh, he and others were part of conversations developing this new management plan for our trout streams. So now within New York state, trout streams are managed either as a wild trout stream or a stocked trout stream. So in 2020 and a little bit into 2021, but mainly throughout 2020, all streams and rivers within New York state were electroshocked by the DC. And if they found wild fish, it was labeled as a wild trout stream. Now there's three different categories, wild, wild quality, and wild premier. Each one of those is managed different. It's just looking at the area of the stream as well as the fish in that area. Um, and then there's two different categories of stocked streams. Basically, if a stream has wild fish in it, the DEC will no longer stock fish over top of those wild fish. Um, and to me, I think that is wonderful. We still have streams that are stocked. And you know what? If you want to go and catch a bunch of fish and put them in your freezer and have a reliable and probably easier catch, well, there you go. You want to take a kid fishing and go get them on some stock trout, by all means. I'm teaching a buddy to fly fish. I'm going to get them on some stock brown soon so we can get that confidence boost that we all need sometimes. Um, but now the streams with wild trout in them, instead of adding trout that grow up in a tank, now they're focusing on habitat improvement, habitat management, which I saw earlier by your presentation. I know your chapter is working on, which I commend you for and, and think it's a fantastic thing that you're doing. Um, so I think that's one of the things that our data has led to, and I'm not at all taking complete credit for it, but I do know that we had peace in that and showing that, hey, if you have wild fish that have been here for all that time, let them be, help them make their habitat a little bit better, um, but we don't need to put stocked fish on top of them. And I'm hoping that the state that I live in now in Vermont takes notice of that. I have a great stream I fish, beautiful stream, wonderful metamorphic rock, um, gorgeous place. Matt, you fished it with me. And um, there's these amazing wild rainbows, silver, chrome, they're beautiful. And every year Vermont goes in and stocks 600 browns right on top of them. And I don't understand it. I can, as soon as I hook a fish, I know what it is. Because um, it either fights or it kind of just twists. But um, so this is one of the things that our data has contributed to, and we're really, really pleased that that contribution was noted. And uh, we're really pleased by that new management plan that the state has. So, uh, so again, revisiting that slide again, showing the idea of, you know, wild fish, stocked fish hybridizing, and uh, some data that led to a little bit of improvement and a little bit of change in our lives. So, um, so this is kind of my, always my little, my little wrap up here. Uh, you know, when we look at trout power, again, we are, we're a unique organization. We certainly have our own niche that we've gone into um, doing, looking at this biodiversity within brook trout. Um, to me, you know, 
the thing that's still, you know, year after year, every time that we have one of these events, that's just really, really cool. And I'm sure you guys see it, whether it's, you know, volunteering with TU or whether it's going and, you know, fishing the salt and fishing coasts is just seeing the, the, the passion of people in the fishing community, you know, fishermen, fisherwomen, just the amount of passion that fishers have, um, the distance that people will drive. We have people who come from Boston, who come from Jersey, who come from New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, um, Pennsylvania, from all over, uh, just to maybe catch a fish. You know, we have a lot of times, we don't even know if there are fish there. We think there are, but we have no idea if they are there and what they are. Um, so we have a lot of people who go just on a whim just to go and catch usually, albeit beautiful, but really, really small fish. Um, and these are all just different pictures of fish that we've caught. Every single uh, fish on this slide are, albeit very strange, um, unique biological brook trout that you can find in the Adirondack Park. Um, so you go out and again, you catch these little jewels on these little fly rods and these little streams. However, uh, and this is where it sometimes gets really fun, is that you go out into these little streams where you have no idea what's there and you drop a fly in the water um, and you catch something like that. So that is a wild, genetically unique brook trout from a small Adirondack stream, um, caught on a six and a half foot two weight rod on a small little olive woolly bugger. And uh, that's a, that's a, I wasn't there to see the fish. Uh, my buddy Mark caught it. He swears it was over 20 inches long. And you know what? I think it is. I think I actually believe him. Usually I don't believe people when they give me lengths, but regardless, when you show up to a little stream and you don't know if anything's there and you pull that out, I don't care if you're used to catching blue marlin, you are jazzed. That's a pretty cool catch. So that's part of it. The mystery to us and not knowing what's there until we get there is just, it's part of the romance of what we do. So that is trout power. That is what we do. That is how we do it. Um, I appreciate everyone following along, listening to me speak. If you've never gone trout or brook trout fishing before, put it on your list. It's tremendously fun. Um, if you have any interest in keeping up with Trout Power and what we do, uh, we have our website there, troutpower.org. Uh, we're pretty active on Instagram as well as Facebook if you're a social media fan. Um, and then just this year, we've had a lot of people over the years asking us to form a membership. We have that as well. Um, so if you ever wanna come and join us or just support us from afar, uh, that option is on our website as well. So um, again, appreciate everyone listening. And, uh, and again, as mentioned, appreciate everyone and what you do, um, supporting fish, wild fish, and uh, trying to keep our fisheries healthy and sustainable through all the challenges that they face, both natural and unnatural. So uh, thank you all so much. Obviously, any questions that anyone has about what we do, how we do it, or anything of like, um, happy to answer those. And again, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I had a bunch of questions, but you answered almost all of them. Oh, so, wow. Uh, but, all right. Uh, I, I was waiting and you, you got to the, are there any questions from folks in the team? Here? Yeah, I have a question. Well, Please. first of all, I thought, it, I thought it was a great talk and I actually enjoyed the science parts, especially the geologic history in the beginning. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Uh, um, I have a connection to the Adirond Adirondacks. My family had a house up there in Keene, and I, that's where I learned to fly fish on the east branch of the US Sable in the 70s and 80s. And I heard a lot about acid rain, and you mentioned it, but so what is the status now? Is that situation kind of cleared up, or, or what's the situa situation with the acid rain? I, I would say that it's improved. I, I, I wouldn't use the, the verb it's cleared up, but it's clearing up. I'll say that, Bob. It's definitely improved. Um, that watershed that we're doing long-term monitoring studies on, uh, we have data taken by not a, an official trout power volunteer, um, but someone who frequented the area back in the 90s and the 80s. And that stream pH-wise was more acidic than table vinegar in 1998. And now um, has, has really nice brook trout in it. So the, it is improving overall. And I know areas that have been you know, hit hard by acid rain have improved. I will say though, that from people I talk to in the scientific world, it's improved macroinvertebrate wise and fish wise. Um, I have heard people who still say that they see a lot less amphibian life than they used to see within the Adirondacks. Um, so I, I can't speak specifically to that. That's just kind of the word of mouth that I've heard. But overall, yes, we've seen a number of examples where 
you know, the water is much more basic than it was, and obviously is enough, basic enough, pardon me, to sustain, to sustain those species. Okay, so if, if it was like vinegar, and now there's brook trout, does that mean that not all the brook trout died? Yeah, oh, well, that's what our hypothesis is. Our hypothesis is, is that, especially within that watershed that we've done a lot of work on, um, what we found is that, especially as you move up into the headwaters, two things happen. One, there's a much greater buffering capacity within the geology and the ground. Um, you know, in terms of acid rain, part of it is the acid, the acidic content of the water, but a lot of it too is what it leaches out of the soil and the, the benthic zone of these streams and it releases a lot of toxic metals like aluminum, for example. So that's part of it. So when you see ground and soil that has a higher buffering capacity, that shows, okay, this would have been a more resilient habitat and environment. Um, and then the other piece too, is that in those zones, we find a lot of groundwater seeps. So a lot of areas where we can measure groundwater. So what we kind of hypothesize is that these brook trout were probably hanging out near those groundwater seeps in areas where the soil had that higher buffering capacity, hung on for dear life. And then eventually as that water, you know, became more basic, they were able to return down and spread throughout the watershed and repopulate. Great, thanks. Yeah, of course, great questions. Any other questions? I actually have a question, which uh, maybe I should know as a board member of Trout Power, but um, with regards to uh, sort of mapping adaptations, do you know if there are specific traits sort of related to thermal regulation or other genetic traits that we are targeting to sort of map and monitor over the course of time to see if we're observing changes in these fish? as the climate is changing? Sure there are, I don't know what they are. And and, may, and Matt, that'll be something that once Spencer gets his hand on the results from the past couple of years, because microsat, what we did in 16 to 19, would not be able to show that adaptation. So the results that we have concretely wouldn't show that. But I'm sure that there are, and I'm sure that Spencer, well, I sure as hell hope Spencer will know what they are, because I don't, but I'm sure he will. That's his job. So yes, there will be. And I can't wait to know what they are. Um, I have a question not related to what you do at Trout Power, but when you showed that waterfall, it made me think about something. We're always going to remove man-made impediments to fish migration. But when you have a naturally occurring piece of geology like a waterfall, there, there's, I guess it kind of hands off, right? Or would you try and intervene? I mean, from, from our perspective and my perspective as a fisherman, yeah, I think it's, you know, again, we're, we're studying these fish and how they've, they've acclimated naturally. So, um, yeah, I, I don't envision us taking any fish and launching them shot put style <laughs> over a waterfall. That would probably be pretty bad optics, really. But, yeah. but it is a good, it is certainly a, a good thought and a good notion. But, um, you know, when we, when we see a waterfall like that, the first thing that I think um, is, and this is just the fisherman in me, but my first thing is that we need to get fish, we need to fish above it. Um, that actual stream uh, is a stream called Hamilton Lake Stream. We walked five miles on that stream and didn't see or move a fish. And then we got above a small waterfall and the very first pool we caught a fish. And then the next pool we caught a fish. And then, so mm -hmm. those barriers are natural barriers and whether it's from predators trying to move upstream or you know, coming down, maybe there's an area upstream of that that's being stocked. So anytime we see natural barriers, yes, we're always, always hands off for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, okay. with that, I think, um, I believe that I side with some other folks. I like the science part too, both the geology, the genetics, some of it reminded me of looking at my 23 and me uh, charts of how I compare to some of my potential relatives and how many potential genes we share. Um, really, really um, very scientific approach to what you're doing up there, plus the citizen and science engagement of your community up there. I'm glad to hear that you are also participating or have gotten another TU chapter to get engaged with you, because I know that wasn't really the case in the beginning when you're organization started. So uh, I think the success story of 
your organization needs to continue and be visible to the rest of Bell Unlimited. Uh, there's always things that we can learn from each other. And thank you for the compliments that uh, of what we are doing with our chapter. Uh, but again, it's it's not me that's doing that. It's everyone that's on this call here or people that could be present or our partners with like the Ponset River Watershed or Charles Rivers that we work with sometimes and, and others. So um, big congratulations to what you've accomplished so far. I put a link in there to some of our events and our meetings and um, um, to Trout Power. So if anyone wants to uh, go as simple as getting a sticker or donating some money, um, or is there a newsletter sort of sign up you can do? There is. Well, and actually, you don't even need to sign up. Um, you can follow us on social media, but also anytime that we have a newsletter, we post that right on the website. And we'll have one that'll probably come out. We pull one out in April, so there will be one that's coming out uh, yeah. coming out pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. So, but awesome. Well, thank you, Rui. And again, thank you for yeah. uh, for everyone. And again, commend you all on what you're doing down there. And hope you enjoy the the spring salt season and enjoy the hockey playoffs because i'm sure probably all of you are bruins fans yeah. so congratulations on that i've been a sabers fan so it's been you know it's been a pretty shit 10 years but really really happy for all of you and you know wish you the best of luck so yeah congratulations and, and, and matt also thank you for introducing us to your uh, cousin and having him as a guest speaker i think is really very informative and for all of you that are taking the reins at uh, gbtu as i hand them off over the next week or so Thank you for what you are going to do in the future. Thanks, Rui. And thank you, Chris, too. Great presentation. And I also like the science lesson. And thank you for not giving us any pop quizzes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chris. That was, that was a really excellent presentation. I really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank thanks you. again to Rui for his leadership for quite a few years now. All right. See you next month in Wellesley, hopefully uh, live face to face, and um, we'll go from there. Yep. Have a good night and a good week, right. everyone. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Good